Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Faye Shalaton. I'm the Ohio Regional Rep, actually Northern Ohio. We, the South seceded from the North in the last year. <laughs> and I, it is my joy to uh, be here today with Doug Wright. And um, I can't imagine there's anyone in the room who doesn't know who he is, but I'll give you the thumbnail sketch. A Dallas native who rose from president of the Highland Park High School Thespian Club. <laughs> And I think his kindergarten teacher said he played well with others. <laughs> to Yale and NYU trained playwright. He subsequently gave the world dozens of theatrical works, including Unwrap Your Candy, The Stonewater Rapture, Interrogating the Nude, Quills, I Am My Own Wife, and the book for Grey Gardens, uh, Saw Berkeley, The Little Mermaid, and Hands on a Hard Body. Along the way, he collected the Kessel Ring Prize, an Obie, Tony, Pulitzer, a Lambda Literary Award, multiple fellowships, and countless friends and admirers. After you hear him expound for the next 45 minutes on the three things every playwright needs to know, talking about creativity, craft, and career, I expect you'll join his legion of fans. I bring you Doug Wright's most unforgettable character, Doug Wright. <laughs> Thank you, Faye. <laughs> so let's begin with creativity. Uh, what do you identify as your greatest motivation for writing? And how does this square with your notion of the purpose of art? It's a great question, Faye. And, Thank and that you. intro is, is hard to follow. Uh, I guess I write, uh, I think, and this is a very bold claim, but I think that artists are responsible for curating the collective conscience of a people. And I think that that's a powerful incentive to write. Now, that also presupposes that you think of yourself as an ethical, moral person. <laughs> uh, one hopes. Uh, but uh, I, I often think that the thing a theater most resembles in form is a church. And I think when it comes to preserving the enduring human verities of, of kindness and truth and compassion and empathy, I would even be brazen enough to suggest that I think artists as a collective have maybe functioned more efficiently than the clergy. Uh, and so I think it is a, as Teresa so beautifully said in her talk, I think it's a noble calling and a necessary calling. So I think a lot of us write out of a sense of inequity or rage or disenfranchisement or feeling like we're uh, on the outside looking in. As artists, we, we kind of willingly cast ourselves as outsiders in the culture and that what is what gives us the requisite distance to write about it. So I think rage is a great motivator for, for uh, creating work. Uh, and I also think you write, I write, out of a desire to see my own experience reaffirmed in the human sphere. I think any time you write a play, you're sort of saying, this obsesses me, this concerns me, this freaks me out and worries me a lot. How do you feel? And if 500 people sitting in the dark go, it freaks me out too. You know that you're all engaged in the same endeavor, which is uh, living among fellow human beings. So I think we do it for that kind of affirmation. And uh, on a far more pragmatic level, I think the most potent muse is always a firm deadline. <laughs> All right, you spoke about rage, but where are you emotionally? Describe where you are when you generally sit down to write. Usually a place of anxious frustration <laughs> uh, because I feel like I uh, overwhelm myself with too many commitments. And so I say yes to too many things. And so I'm always writing down with a sense that I'm woefully behind and this will be the latest commission in the history of the American theater and I need to finish it so I can get on to the next thing. And then you start writing and you just pray for that ineffable click where what the characters are saying to each other and what they're facing is more compelling than the vagaries of your own schedule. And uh, hopefully that happens. And then you're off to the races. Yeah. 
on subject matter, where are you? If there were a continuum of write what you know and write what you don't know, where do you fit? I'm emphatically, emphatically in the write what you don't know category. I think you should write about the things that vex and confuse you. You should write about the things for which you have no answers. And in the search for them, you might write something meaningful. I think if you're writing what you know, it's uh, uh, usually uh, less dimensional. Because if you have the answer and you're dispensing the answer, there's really no mystery. And so I think you have to write to the core of those things that confound you. Um, your characters are most often what we would uh, charitably call marginal. Um, <laughs> Outcasts, outsiders, subver subversives, iconoclasts. Uh, take the Marquis de Sade, who is not only an unrepentant sitter, sinner, he's positively unredeemable. Uh, what makes you gravitate to the likes of the Marquis de Sade, or for that matter, Charlotte von Malstorff, or the Beals? I think that marginal characters, or characters who exist on the fringe, are extraordinarily useful figures in drama. And we tend to think of them as the other, but they're not. They're really us distilled. They're our obsessions and our worries and our eccentricities polished to a high sheen. We can look at the Beals and we can say, that's not me. But we all have that drawer in our desk that we won't open because it's so full of things we're terrified to confront. We all have that. They're just that writ large. Uh, the same way uh, I think a character like the Marquis de Sade. One of the greatest mysteries on the planet, one of the most savage, amusing, infinitely varied activities we have is sex. He was simply interested to what most of us would consider a fairly pathological degree. But we're all interested, <laughs> right? Uh, so I think in these characters we can see our own foibles with a kind of clarity. So it's not writing about other people. I think it's about putting ourselves under the microscope when we tackle figures like that in our fiction. So I also think that, again, as I was saying that outsiders tend to be the artist in a culture. I tend to write about outsiders. And I just think that's historically true. Like, if you want to know about the history and the institution of, say, marriage, ask a gay person in a state where it's not legal. Chances are they're preoccupied enough with it to have done pretty rigorous homework and be able to tell you about an institution that you might just know experientially. They can probably fill you in historically because they're excluded. And, and I think as artists, we do that again and again and again. We're, we're pressed against the glass looking in. And that gives you a sharper sense of vision. And, and so I think uh, as artists, we're outsiders. And I think writing about outsiders is instructive and yields very particular, very human dividends. And, um, and you've articulated that. If you want to go a little further about how do these outsiders serve art, the purpose of art. Oh, that's fantastic. I think I was just at a, a, a theater retreat in uh, New Hampshire with a bunch of, of Dartmouth students. And we were talking about the role of art in the culture. And we were talking in particular about how art is always under assault in the public school system. And that made me think, and, and, and it, it made me think that when you're a kid, the first way you start to experience and learn about the world is bedtime stories. So from our very first sense of consciousness and communication with our parents, we're learning about the world through narrative. And if mommy reads to us that Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water and Jack fell down, if we have fallen down, if we have skinned our knee, we instantly feel for Jack. That's not fun. And then as we get older, we go into, say, high school, uh, we can be uh, an <coughs> African-American student in an urban school, and we can read Diary of Anne Frank. Maybe we read it aloud in class. Maybe we do it as a school play. And suddenly, this African-American student can claim to know something about the experience of the Holocaust. 
and can have walked in Anne Frank's shoes. I look at a play like my, my dear friend Moises Kaufman's Laramie Project. Kids all over the country, it was the most produced play in high schools for almost three years in a row. I don't think we'd be where we are in terms of gay culture and gay politics if a lot of young people hadn't grown up on that play and know, regardless of their own sexuality, what it means like to be gay in a rural setting. So I think, and now, you know, we can go to the theater and see Mary Queen of Scots, you know, uh, battling for her life and we can connect to it and know something of that experience. So art's role in the culture is to teach us empathy. It's to teach us to bridge the superficial differences of creed or ethnicity or philosophy, ideology, geography, and connect to what it means to be universally human. And any time, I maintain, I really believe this, you start to strip or reduce art in the culture, you are pushing the culture towards sociopathology. You are stripping it of its capacity to learn, experience, and act empathetically. And I think if we can look at characters as marginal as the Beals, as eccentric as Charlotte von Malsdorf in rural Berlin, or as seemingly reprehensible as the Marquis de Sade, and some tiny voice in us can say, I get it. I know what it must have been like to be them. Then art is fulfilling, I think, its cultural function. And then you wrote 10 characters in search of a Nissan pickup <laughs> uh, with hands on a hard body. Uh, two years ago when we had our conference in Virginia, you were still, you were coming out of that research time. Now you've spent three years with these characters who are not the Marquis de Sade. They're, they're much, they're marginal, but in their own way. Do you want to talk about what compelled you to spend three years with 10 people who were willing to be part of a marathon to win a truck? That was an amazing experience uh, and, and one that I, I so deeply value. I saw the documentary, and as many of you may know, it's a documentary about a contest that took place in rural East Texas where contestants were invited to stand in a parking lot and place their hand on a pickup truck, and whoever could remain standing the longest won the truck. And it sounds absurd, and it sounds simple, uh, but uh, in it, I thought there was a really great metaphor for American striving. And, and the contest organizers thought it would last for 36 hours. It lasted for five days. People needed that truck, and they needed it for very, very uh, emotional and compelling reasons. And, and so to me, it, it epitomized the American dream because on the one hand, this country promises us that if you work hard, you get things. And underneath that is the darker, more Darwinian truth, survival of the fittest. And where do those two things come together in our culture? Because they seem irreconcilable, but they're two sides of the same dream. So I thought this would be a great piece to use as a template to write about the recession, to write about income inequality, to write about the problem of immigration, and to take all those sort of front page stories and refract them through this crazy contest. And so the documentary is about 15 years old, and the filmmaker was very young when he made it and failed to get releases from the contestants. So the first thing that my colleague Amanda Green and I did was to hire a private detective in East Texas and say, here's, here's the movie, find these eight people. These are the stories we have to tell. So the private detective found them and we flew to Longview, Texas uh, with a list of addresses and a list of releases and we started knocking on doors and saying, you know, we're from New York and we write for the Broadway theater and you were in a movie 15 years ago and we got invited in for chicken salad and uh, it, was, it was amazing, it was just amazing and we became really attached to these, these remarkable people and their stories and uh, we uh, uh, contracted them all and gave them all a piece of the property in the hopes that it could change their own fortunes because they were a pretty hard scrabble group and one of the most glorious nights in, in my career was the opening night of the show when our producers very generously flew them up from Longview, Texas. For most of them, the first time in New York City. For some of them, the first time on an airplane. And uh, each of them got a curtain call with their doppelganger, the actor who played them in the show. And it was profound, and it was profound. And I think that uh, as someone who 
spent a, I came from Texas, uh, and I've had a love-hate relationship with my home state for a very long time. Uh, and in this piece, I was finally able to make my peace with uh, a very problematic and challenging area of the country and my own heritage there. So it felt like the whole act of writing it was healing in a way. So uh, its fortunes on Broadway were devastatingly, uh, uh, it was a devastatingly brief run and all of us I think are still sorting through our PTSD in that regard. But as a career experience for three years of my life, I got to wake up every morning thrilled about the prospect of sitting down at the, the computer, and, and that's a pretty precious gift. So you've shown from these plays what it is that makes you hang on to something, like a dog with a bone for those years. What would make you abandon a project? That's a great question. You know, it's tough, because I tell my students, I say, it's a terribly presumptuous thing to say to a room full of strangers, listen to me for two and a half hours. And, oh, and, and pay me, 150 bucks maybe, that's good. And, and don't interrupt and sit quietly and don't talk to me about it, go home after. That is so presumptuous. And so I tell my students, if you expect strangers to listen to you for two and a half hours about something, it better be an obsession or an interest that can fuel you for about five years. Less than that, and don't, don't take my time. You know, and, and so I have tended to get pretty insanely obsessed with my subjects. And, and this is perhaps a, a death knell to admit this, but I never, in my adult life as a kid, I, I, I messed around with drafts, but I haven't abandoned a play yet. Wow. And that may or may not continue. I've also, to earn a living, I've written written many film scripts that proudly line some of the most prestigious filing cabinets in Los Angeles. <laughs> but, uh, but that's different. I like to think those projects abandoned me. I didn't <laughs> abandon them. Uh, but uh, uh, I play so far, I, I haven't. Now, that's not to say it won't happen. But I think if you're going to, I'm not, I'm not the most prolific writer. I don't turn out a play a year, as many of my colleagues do, and, and, and many brilliant plays, I'm slow. I take three to five years to write a play. And, and I think it's because I have to feel that degree of maniac passion about it. Which moves us very conveniently into craft. Um, to what extent, for example, since you described your research for Hands on a Hard Body, or Hard Body, how do you yeah. <laughs> Hard body. Um, it, people get so confused. I think that was one of the not selling points about the play because <laughs> nobody knew whether it was a sex show or not. <laughs> um, the, your process, um, is it this pretty much the same? Does it begin with a ton of research or is every project its own journey? I think every project is its own journey, although I've realized there are certain truisms that I can count on. Like research is obviously essential if you're writing about a historical subject. It's also the best procrastinatory device in the world. <laughs> so you can be midway through a first act and go, I don't know something. I better go check that book. But you don't have to have read every book before you start. And it's taken me a while to learn that. And it's the act of writing a play that teaches you the research. It's not something that they aren't separate steps of the process. So I think I've learned that over time. And that's been really, really helpful. Uh, because in the past, I've used it as a, a vehicle to not write. And the best way to write is always to actually, dare one say it, write. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? <laughs> Uh, many people speak about finding the truth of a play. Since you tend to write about real people and events, tell us what you're willing to sacrifice in order to tell an honest story. Well, that's a great question. I like that you like the question. No, I have a, I have a very movable conscience in this regard. Uh, when I wrote Quills, it's a historical play. It's about the Marquis de Sade. Uh, but it's also an allegory about the nature of free expression. And I sort of read all the requisite biographies. I read everything Saad wrote, which I would not recommend. Uh, I uh, uh, became something of a, a, a garden scholar on the man. And uh, then I said, OK, I'm going to construct a narrative. And I said to myself, Saad is more than a man. He has become iconic. He is an enormous symbol of a lot of things. And other writers, far greater than I, from Yukio Mishima to Peter Weiss, have appropriated Saad's mythology 
and placed him in their fiction. I looked at the library shelf and I saw there are 20 really readable, scrupulously researched biographies about the Marquis de Sade available. The historical record, the biographical record, is there. Anyone who sees my play and wants to know what was true, what wasn't true, when did you take license, when did you not, has a wealth of resources to draw upon. In addition, any time you write a play about a real figure, there are thousands of frustrated academics who are experts on your topic, who see their first chance to get a piece of the New York Times about what you got wrong. So there are a million police out there to correct you. So with Saad, I felt like I could take extraordinary license with his life. Uh, because there are plenty of people out there ready to correct me, and the public record and, and, and the volume of information on him is vivid and clear. I don't know if any of you saw the movie of, of Quills. It, it was adapted from the play, but uh, Saad's dying moment is when uh, the priest, played by Joaquin Phoenix, is trying to administer the last rites, and Saad bites off and eats the crucifix on his rosary, and then he dies. And uh, the actual Marquis de Saad had a great fondness for bonbons, ate far too much, and, and died as a result. Well, I maintain that I was telling the larger truth because on set, that crucifix was it's made chocolate. of chocolate. <laughs> uh, but uh, more seriously, when I wrote I Am My Own Wife, that's a play that was about a marginal figure that was completely unknown, certainly to American culture. She had some celebrity in Berlin, but none, no currency in our uh, country. And if you wanted to learn what was true about her and what wasn't after seeing my play, you couldn't go to the library. You couldn't check out a book. There are no academic experts on the life of Charlotte von Malsdorf. So even though I wanted to tell specific truths about the nature of curatorship and the recording of history, which are sort of the themes of the play, I felt like to invent outright scenes that never occurred, people or characters that she never met, would be dishonest because uh, the play was the world's introduction to her in a way. So I felt that I couldn't engage in the same kind of overt license that I did with the Marquis de Sade. I think all of us as writers have to make decisions about what's moral and what isn't. Certainly with hands on a hard body, uh, I'll never forget, uh, I was in La Jolla, and, and one of the real life characters, this wonderful man from Gladewater, Texas, named J.D. Drew, was in town. And he and I went out for a beer. And I said, now, J.D., I, I just want to tell you about the play. You get uh, pretty upset in act two. And you say a couple of curse words. And I want you to know that now, because I know you and your wife are, are uh, good Christian people. And I don't want it to come as a shock when you see the play. And he said, uh, well, Doug. What do I say? And I said, well, JD, you say, son of a bitch. And he said, who the hell hasn't said son of a bitch? I got no problem with that. <laughs> and then I said, so you're OK with hell, too? And he said, yeah, that's not, not a problem. And I said, and late in the second act, you say, god damn. And the color drained from his face. And he said, anyone who knows me knows I would never take the Lord's name in vain and that phrase would never pass my lips. And so I, as a writer, have to make a judgment call. How essential to understanding JD and his experience, as represented in the play, distinct from life, was goddamn to me as a writer. And in that instance, it was a very easy call. I knock on Keith Carradine's dressing room, and I say, cut the goddamn. Uh, piece of cake. Piece of cake. But you have to, in, when you're writing about real life people, you have to engage in those kind of negotiations because it's their truth you're trying to represent. And uh, so anytime we deviated from the experience of these 10 people in Hands on a Hard Body, we would engage in conversation. And, and uh, sometimes, more often than not, they actually wanted the play to work. They had a vested interest in it. And there was one character, Benny Perkins, who was, had a history uh, with issues. He was racist. The guy was racist. He just was. We didn't want to eliminate that from our play, because we'd be eliminating a core truth about that culture. 
It is oftentimes a very racist culture. So we had to sit down with JD and we had to say, we're presenting this. It's a part of your journey in the play. We'll give you an 11 o'clock redemption, <laughs> but we have to show that aspect of your nature. And, and JD was like, hey, if, if I get redeemed, maybe I'm doing better on the stage than I am in life, and maybe I need to work on that. So, you know, they were willing. They were willing, but you have to have that. You have to have that interaction. Great. What's the best playwriting advice you ever received? A wonderful artistic director of uh, the Yale Repertory Theater and, and chair of the Yale Drama School. I did not attend there, but he was the uh, man who produced my first two full-length plays, was Lloyd Richards. And he said something that I just, if I were into tattoos, I'd have it tattooed somewhere. <laughs> uh, and it was, uh, write for an audience that is smarter than you are. Mm -hmm. And that has served me again and again and again. Um, writing for the theater, even if it's just your name on the script, is by definition a collaboration because you've got partners everywhere. Um, name some of the, or a memorable moment that came out of collaboration with a director, drama, drama, dramaturg, former, designer. That would be my dear friend Moises working on I Am My Own Wife. Moises had worked a lot from transcript with plays like Gross Indecency and The Laramie Project. And I had about 500 pages of transcript, my interviews with Charlotta von Malsdorf, and I was really stymied. So in our very first rehearsal at the Sundance Institute, Moises said, let's just pick three moments of transcript uh, that, that compel you, and we'll just play with them. So uh, I picked three moments, and one was a tour Charlotta gave me of the furniture in her museum. One was the first time she ever put on a dress, and the third time was her first trip to West Berlin after the wall fell to see Boys Town, to see the big gay neighborhood that she'd never seen from behind the Iron Curtain. And so Moises took those pages of transcript, gave one to Jefferson Mays, our actor, one to me, and he took one himself, and he said, so tonight, let's all go home and let's, let's do a little theater piece based on this page of transcript that we've each been assigned. And we all went home, and the next day we came in, and uh, Moises had gotten the transcript about the first time Charlotta put on a woman's dress. And, because uh, Charlotta was a biological male, but identified as female. And uh, so Moises simply put two chairs on the stage and draped a black dress over one, stood by the first chair and slowly took off his own clothes and folded them very neatly on the chair, then walked over to the second chair and simply put on the dress. And that was his piece. It was over. And then my piece was about Charlotta's first trip to West Berlin to see the gay clubs. And I had found an old German guidebook that had these sort of campy, outrageous descriptions of each club. And I simply read them aloud, each description. And finally, Jefferson, who is unbelievably inventive, had stayed up most of the night with shirt cardboards from his dry cleaning and had created with a pen knife absolutely beautiful pieces of miniature furniture. And he got the museum tour, and he just placed the miniature furniture on a table and described each piece. All three of those moments wound up in the finished text of the play. So it was revelatory. Great. Um, your book writing credits are stacking up. And for those who are viewing this um, on your computer, you might have heard that this was going to be about book writing for a musical and that collaboration. So we'll address that for just a couple minutes so you don't throw anything at your screen. Um, talk about the special challenges in being part of what is essentially a writing group in musical storytelling. Um, how do you know, for example, when dialogue is better sung than spoken? It's a great question, and I first want to just say that I Am My Own Wife was obviously a watershed moment for me and very, very thrilling, and it was my last straight play. That was 2004. Musicals have been a thrilling place to hide because there are more people to blame, uh, which is also to say there are more people on the dark days to stimulate you, to excite you, to get you to recommit to the project, and to make you look 30 times smarter than you are because of their own magnificent talents. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I have two more musicals that I am excited to finish. 
And I'm also, for the first time in about 10 years, working on a new play. And being alone in a room with it is the most delicious and extraordinary thing. So musicals, in a way, have been uh, a place to hide out for me, I think. I'm extraordinarily proud of the work I've gotten to do. And I've worked with remarkable people and created shows that, that, that I'm proud to be associated with. But uh, it's, uh, it, the collaborative nature of it has been what's made it a safe escape. Uh, and yet, it's also a form that offers very particular pleasures and dividends. And if you want a character to get overtly emotional in a play, you usually need to nurse them along for two or three scenes till you create enough sufficient conflict and anxiety that they can burst into that explosive and beautiful monologue that, you, that you're aiming for. Well, in a musical, you just need about three bars of music and you can get them there. It, it's a whole additional language that you can use as a writer to accelerate and redefine the emotional journeys of your characters. And that's thrilling, because you can cover such expansive emotional terrain, because you have that form. And music is almost wholly emotional, right? It takes you places instantly. A, the chime of a bell, or the strum of a harp, or the sound of a guitar chord, and instantly you go someplace. And that's fantastic. And I found with almost all my uh, collaborators that uh, sometimes you write more for a musical than you do for any other piece. Because again and again, Michael Corey or Amanda Green will say to me, I don't quite get what this number is supposed to be. Would you write the monologue? So you write a monologue, and you give it to them, and it becomes a song. Or you write a love scene, and you give it to them, and it becomes a duet. And those things happen. Uh, you steal their text for a good joke. They steal your text for a good song. Uh, and it's, it's highly collaborative. And uh, every uh, lyricist and composer I've ever worked with, the initial job of structuring the piece and finding the song moments is the three of us uh, together in a room with notes and index cards and research and that sort of mad cross-pollinization that happens. And I really believe, too, when you're working in that kind of environment, you have to honor everybody's impulse, even if you don't understand it. Like, I remember uh, Michael Corey came in during the writings, uh, writing of Grey Gardens, and he was so excited, he was almost trembling, and he said, I have it, I have it. There's going to be a song in the second act where Big Edie cooks corn. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's leaden. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what to do with that dramatically. That's probably the worst idea. But let Michael, so passionate about it, let him work through it in his own idiot, idiot savant way, whatever he does behind closed doors. And, 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 and you'll eventually talk him out of the corn song. But he's so hot to write it, you just have to let him write it. So get out of his way. And he came back with a song called Jerry Likes My Corn, My corn. which is one of the most haunting and beautiful songs, really not about corn at all, but about the nature of motherhood and nurturing, something that Big Edie can do for the homeless Jerry, but that she can't seem to do for her own daughter. And it's one of the most extraordinary numbers in the show. And so when you are working with collaborators, if someone in the room is so passionate about an idea, they simply have to try it, even if it doesn't fit the cosmology of what you've created, you have to say yes, because chances are, if they're that consumed by the idea, they're going to give you something that's gold. So, so that kind of flexibility, I think, is, is crucial. Because uh, it's all about serving, serving the, the work, ultimately. Yeah. And on the career, no matter what success uh, that we enjoy over the years, we're always, uh, it, it seems that it's our most recent project that is where everybody places us. And so uh, getting back to the PTSD on Hands on a Hard Body, um, the critics liked it. The audiences, I mean, we were just, thrilled with the show. Um, describe the roller coaster ride a little bit, because um, our, most of us in this room have not had work on Broadway. Talk about where that put you during the ride. And I'm still... also, I want to know who got to keep the truck. <laughs> the truck is being rented out to resident theater productions happily. Oh, is, so there is so a the life for it. the truck continues to travel. Thank the God. The truck is on okay. tour even if the show is not. Okay. <laughs> uh, I can't. That I, doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's going from uh, resident theater to resident theater. We don't have a, a Broadway tour out. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, I'm still sorting through it, and I can't lie. It was probably I cared so much about that piece, 
And that piece was, uh, I watched the movie, I thought of the idea, I called Amanda, we went to Texas, and we didn't have Broadway producers involved till a certain juncture. Uh, but I think there were a lot of things that I learned about Broadway. I'd been a little spoiled because I and my own wife had moved to Broadway, Greg Gardens had moved, and of course, Little Mermaid, uh, which was classified uh, in, in Disney's cosmology as a disappointment. It ran two years, which is the longest I've ever had anything run on Broadway. Uh, so their disappointment was uh, my great victory. But uh, <laughs> I, I would say with what, what I've come to think about Hands on a Hard Body, uh, it was an eccentric title and an idiosyncratic subject. And I think the public at large thought people standing around a truck, that's pretty static. And of course, the job of theater artist is to liberate the static, to make what's immovable move, to make what's sedentary fly. That's what we do. And we knew that truck was going to move like a mofo, and there would be dance and movement and energy in the piece. That was the glorious challenge of it. But audiences, we didn't communicate that, I think. And uh, in addition, uh, when you have a piece that's idiosyncratic and perhaps different, off-Broadway and, 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 and institutional theater in New York is your friend because it creates a conversation about the work among the New York theater-going community. And if you have a show running for eight weeks at Playwrights Horizons or the Atlantic Theater Company and no one can get a ticket, but at dinner parties around town people are saying, it sounds crazy, but it's kind of good. You should go see it. You start to build momentum. So then when a show transfers to Broadway, the audience has spent a lot of time educating itself. A play about an obscure German transvestite behind the Iron Curtain, that's not an easy sell. But eight weeks at Playwrights Horizons, when it was being talked about at dinner parties all over town, you create appetite in a way that press pieces cannot do. And if I could do it all over again, I would not have dropped a sort of delicate Texas blue bonnet like hard body in the hot crucible of Broadway, which in some ways you still have to earn unless you have name recognition or a subject that already has caught the public's fancy. And then you have to deliver. But, uh, but for us, I think it was uh, incredibly difficult to sell the show without any pre-existing conversation about it. And I also think Again, we were using the show to talk about issues like income inequality, the recession, the immigration issue. And when we opened on Broadway, the stock market turned up. The housing market started to come back. And there was an immigration bill before both houses of Congress. And I think a lot of people thought to pay 150 bucks a seat to see a show about the have-nots was not your first choice for Mother's Day. And I think that we missed the zeitgeist. And that's something you can't control. I still believe in the piece enormously. It's one of the, my favorite things I've ever worked mm -hmm. on. Uh, but uh, you have to catch the popular imagination. And at the time we came along, all of those arguments had played out in the election. The election had concluded. A man was in office. And those voices went silent. And, and suddenly, we were saying, don't you want to talk about these front page issues? Don't you want to talk about them? Well, the nation was exhausted from talking about them. So I think that, uh, and these are things that as a writer you can't control. You're just trying to tell the truth of that one East Texas guy who's got his hand on that truck at 4 AM on the third day. And you can't control those other variables. But uh, it was uh, one of the most profound and happy and joyous working experiences of my career. And I can say that I got some terribly fancy hardware that graces my mantle for, for I am my own wife, and now I'm on the wall at Joe Allen. So uh, my, my career no, has run not. the spectrum. That wouldn't put you on the wall. Oh, it did. Oh, it did. no. It did. Well, I'm going somewhere else next. <laughs> What's on the drawing board? You said you have two musicals on the drawing board and a straight play. Anything you want to talk about? Do you want to? Do you want to talk about it? Sure. Uh, there's a, a musical. There, there are four projects right now that are uh, making me a little crazy. But uh, there, there's a musical that I'm extravagantly excited about that is hopefully headed to Broadway with uh, the illustrious uh, 
producers, uh, David Stone and, and Mark Platt, and I've been sworn to secrecy, but uh, uh, we had a 29 hour reading of it in June and, and it seemed to go well and we're doing a workshop in December. So hopefully that will stay on track. Sounds like a passion play. Uh, you said 29 hours. Oh, <laughs> it does. Uh, it's, it's an equity rule, uh, not, a, not a biblical okay. rule. Uh, uh, although those things are frequently confused. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, and then I'm working on a play. Uh, the play is for the Atlantic Theater Company. I was in, uh, I'll curse it now, I'll tell you what it's about and then I'll never finish it. But uh, I was in Oslo, Norway, and I was at the studio of this renowned sculptor, a man named Gustav Vigeland who uh, was a sculptor at the turn of the last century and is not well known outside Oslo because all of his work is there and they've never released it. So he doesn't have work in museums internationally. But there was incredibly, whoops, sorry. There was this incredibly uh, compelling uh, series of busts that were I I in a row in the studio. And one was a sort of puffy man with giant mutton chops and this kind of furious expression very dramatic plaster cast. And then next to it, it looked like the same man, but his hair was gone. And then next to it, his cheeks were sunken and his eyes were set back. And slowly, as I looked at these six plaster casts, it was the same man, but increasingly emaciated. And I was really haunted by it, so I started to read about these, uh, these studies, and it turned out that Gustav Vigeland had been commissioned by the cultural ministry in Norway to complete a bust of one of its most famous citizens, but after uh, his first sitting, he had a very serious stroke. And every time he returned to sit, he was so diminished physically that Vigeland had to throw out the previous study and begin anew. So he never completed the bust, but he got a remarkable record of a man dying. And the sitter was Henrik Ibsen. So uh, oh. the play imagines those sittings. Uh, uh, so. It's a piece called Posterity, and it's, it's for the Atlantic. So we'll see. Uh, uh, Teresa said that she doesn't know she's going to finish a play until she's on page 62. <laughs> I'm only on about page 22, so it's anybody's guess. Yeah. So I'm going to jump to my last question so we allow some time for questions in the audience. Uh, you have uh, such a list of achievements, um, but we can celebrate that you're too young for a Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> so as an emerging playwright, <laughs> what do you still hope to do? Oh, that's such a great question. I turned 50 this year, and depending on where you are, you know, that's... It, it's uh, so young. But it feels, like, it feels like a landmark age regardless. Uh, and it does make you aware of time in a new way. And I don't think it's any, uh, when I say right about what vexes or confuses or confounds you. So I'm 50 now and there's a time clock that there never was before. It's not a pressing one, it's not an urgent one, but it's there and I never heard it ticking before. And I hear it ticking now. And I'm writing a play about a playwright facing his own mortality and taking stock as he's being committed to portraiture, uh, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, uh, so I think uh, that, I think this is a dream that we all have. I think what I'd like to do is have that one project that is enough of a populist success that I am liberated to sit in my own room inside my own feverish, tortured little brain and write whatever I want to. And I haven't achieved that yet. I've had some wonderful opportunities and some remarkable experiences, but I haven't uh, found that one elusive work that will actually pay the bills. So I still hold out hope that that will happen and in it I'll find my Medici that lets me paint crazy things on the ceiling for the rest of time so that I never again have to worry about a piece's economic success or failure. Beautiful. Um, would you like to contribute to the dialogue? Yes. I'll repeat the question rather than worrying about a mic. Okay. I, I hope it's not too long. Doug, I am the Dallas Fort Worth Regional Rep. Yay! Yay! where the uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was, uh, was 
arrested. And so for our season opener in October, we're doing Black at the Assassination because we think that that's a perspective, a story that hasn't been told. But there is such anxiety about that subject matter, particularly in Dallas. And I know that you know that. And my question is, how would you approach it? I think that we're pulling this gap off of a, a 50 year old wound. In fact, when we were uh, workshopping the piece, there were African Americans who said that they had not, they were not able to talk about it. They were, it just, it was just a, tra a tragedy that people couldn't talk about. So we're hoping that I absolutely applaud you for doing that. I think it's thrilling because what could be? I'm just oh, I'm in so case sorry. it didn't get picked uh, up. Our representative from the Dallas Fort Worth area runs a theater that is about to do an, uh, is presumably provocative and exciting new play that deals with the Kennedy assassination and issues of race, incendiary issues in Dallas, and have been for 50 years. And uh, she's asking how to control the controversy. Yeah. And I say, stoke it, baby. Uh, <laughs> and and I say, what you do. Uh, uh, it, it's going to happen anyway. Right. So I think what you do is you sit down with your funders and you brace them for the fight and you educate them about how to sensitively respond to questions and concerns about the piece that push it toward a positive place. Arrange public forums around the piece so that people who are enthusiastic about it and bothered by it feel like they have an opportunity to express that range of feeling. Uh, so arm yourselves in smart ways so that you don't uh, undermine yourself and your institutional health because you're doing something provocative. But uh, uh, in a way, you've got a, 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 a lit stick of dynamite and you're about to throw it. And, and, and so now's uh, not the time to say, are we going to hurt anybody? <laughs> I mean, you're, 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 you're poised to go, right? And, and, and I think it's fantastic, and I think it's a debate that Dallas needs, and I think you're courageous to take it on. So educate your funders, talk to your board, make sure that any conversation that could happen outside the theater has been rehearsed inside the theater. But embrace what you're doing, because you know you're scared to death, but there's some impish, artist, provocateur part of you that is thrilled you're about to do this, and embrace that self. <laughs> and you'll be pleasantly surprised. People can take a lot more than we give them credit for. Eileen. What was your first break? Where, where did you really begin? When, who, what was your first production, for instance? Well, my first break was having parents who, on a rainy Saturday afternoon, thought it would be worthwhile to take their eight-year-old son to the Dallas Theater Center to see Life with Father by Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss. <laughs> and that was my first break, because that whetted my appetite and pointed me on a direction that uh, uh, kept me safe in Texas, helped me find a peer group, uh, let me feel like I had worth in the world, because I was good at it and it wasn't football. All those things. Uh, so, that was, so that was the most amazing break. Uh, more pragmatically and in career terms, I wrote a play as my graduate school thesis at NYU that was accepted by the Eugene O'Neill Playwright Center and happily then went on to production at the Yale Repertory Theater. Which one was that? Uh, it was called Interrogating the Nude oh. and it was about the artist Marcel Duchamp. And uh, so uh, it was Lloyd Richards' production and that's when he gave me that, that glorious advice, write for an audience that's smarter than you are. Yes. Uh, just along those lines, uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your sort of uh, uh, fixation on artists that are not writers, uh, with the exception, I guess, of uh, Marquis de Sade. And, uh, you just seem to always be drawn to these people who are sort of interpreted, interpreting the world and the experience of it, though not necessarily through the direct way that you're doing it yourself. And I just, I was wondering if there's like something you think about in terms of that, or if it's something you don't even think about. Oh, it's a great question, and 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 maybe I. I don't have a good answer. I know I'm, uh, I've always been really obsessed with visual art and I was an art history major in college. And uh, uh, also visual art is exciting to realize on stage because you can explode it in certain ways. Uh, so, uh, and I guess I'm also really fundamentally interested in how 
artists place themselves in opposition to the dominant culture in order to teach or instruct or serve as the cultural conscience to that, the, that society. So I think, because uh, that's uh, the, the, the role I'm sometimes, uh, uh, with disastrous results I'm trying to play out in my own life, I guess I examine it again and again in, in my fiction. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, um, it's been a lovely session. And for those of you who can't get enough of Doug Wright, stay in the room, because there's another panel coming up in this room. Um, a friend once told me, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. <laughs> in Doug Wright, we have the whole package. So do stay around. <laughs>